What is up, my exchange family from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Hi, Chief. Hi, Chief. Hi, Leah. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Julie, like you, you're in the office today. That's I I am in the office today. We had a new colleague join our team, so I'm really excited about that. So I came to welcome him today. Awesome, awesome. Well, we're glad to have both of you, and uh, I'm also glad to have my next guest, who is a formal devil devil dog like myself. Um, and for some reason, I feel like we're just booking a whole bunch of Marines. Uh, <laughs> we have more Marines on the show than Army and Air Force, to be honest with you. Uh, but thanks to everyone that's out there booking our guests uh, uh, here on the APs team and finding all these Marines out there doing great things. So uh, Julie, please introduce today's guest. We have a terrific guest today. He served his country as a Marine for four years, deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan. He now serves as the CEO and co-founder of Team Rubicon. And in his new memoir, Once a Warrior, which is available at shopmyexchange.com, he tells how he found his next mission of service after leaving the military. Please help us give a warm chief chat welcome to Jake Wood. Hey. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh-oh. Leah, I think you're... Oh, you oh fail! I was on That's mute! On mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jake, thanks so much for joining us. And for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from. If you have questions for Jake, you can leave them in the comments section. We'll read those live throughout the broadcast. Now is a great time to start your watch party to enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not already following our page, you should. Chief Chats are every week and we have terrific guests, a military exclusive audience uh, interviews lined up for you all spring. Awesome. So Jake, man, first off, ura. Ra. <laughs> <laughs> It is uh, is an honor to have you with us on Chief Chat, uh, and, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and our and our viewers. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Can you let us know uh, where you're coming call, calling us from? Yeah, I'm I'm dialing in live here from uh, Southern California. I live in uh, an area of Los Angeles called Manhattan Beach, and uh, that's because Team Rubicon's headquarters is right up there next to uh, LAX, uh, Los Angeles Airport. Yeah, I'm very familiar with Manhattan Beach. I. I, I take a trip to LA probably about twice a year. I got a friend that lives out there, so. Yeah, it's a good spot to be. It's a good spot to be weathering COVID, I'll tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Jake, we would like to start off with hearing about your military career. What led you to join the military and why the Marines? Sure, uh, great question. I, you know, I joined the military in 2005 and, <clears throat> you know, I was graduating from college went to college at the University of Wisconsin. And obviously in 2005, we were as a nation embroiled in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, I think that I had thought about it throughout my four years uh, in college. You know, I watched uh, the towers come down my freshman year on 9-11. And, and of course, then watched uh, so many men and women go off to war. And so in 2005, I made the decision to join. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps. I ended up enlisting instead of going in uh, through OCS, which was kind of a conscious choice on my part. I, I, I knew I wanted to be in the infantry uh, and you know I didn't want to get kind of stuck in that OCS TBS pipeline. I just kind of, you know, like any 21 year old would say, I just wanted to get out there and get to the fight, um, which is a pretty naive thing to say because the Marine Corps got me to the fight. Um, I served with a battalion in Southern California. That's how I came to Southern California. I was with 27, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment out in 29 Palms, California. The stumps. The, the stumps, uh, <laughs> the worst duty station across the DOD. Uh, great AFIs. Uh, but um, served in Iraq in 2007 uh, in Anbar Province, uh, which was a, a tough and challenging tour. And then I came back from that. I ended up joining uh, the sniper platoon and went through sniper school, which was, you know, a, a challenging uh, 10 weeks, but was lucky enough to graduate. And then uh, was shortly deployed to, or deployed to Afghanistan shortly after that, where I spent uh, seven months in uh, the Helmand Valley in uh, a city known as Sengen, uh, in what was, what would become probably the toughest tour of any Marine battalion that year. 
in 2008. And then um, the next year I decided to get out and uh, move on. I felt really lucky. I had all my fingers and all my toes and a lot of my friends couldn't say the same thing. And so I, I didn't want to you know, subject my, my mother or my family to any more of those, those tours. I know anybody that's been overseas knows that feeling and uh, made the decision to get out. So you, did you join from the West coast or the East coast? So I, well, I'm a, I'm a Hollywood Marine. If that's yeah, Hollywood. Yeah. That, that's yeah. where I was going. <laughs> he was <laughs> yeah, I was up in, in Ray-Bans. That's what I did, man. Oh yeah. Well, that I was, was a, Chief's I was a, nice way of asking that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was a Hollywood Marine too. So, uh, you know, we, we had another guest that was, uh, that, that joined and went to Paris Island. And so, all they do is brag about their uh, their sand fleas. And yeah, I'm like, they've got a, they've got a got. inflated sense of self over there at the yeah. in Paris Island. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Jake, your public writing career began with your personal blog uh, while you were deployed. So what led you to start blogging while you were in Iraq? I, you know, for me, I think it was more just about staying in touch with friends and family. You know, I knew that my opportunities to call home would be pretty limited. And so I just wanted to be able to provide some, some updates. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, while I was over there, it, it really became um, helpful for me to just write about my experiences. I'd, I'd say, I'd go so far as to say it was cathartic to, to get them down on, on paper, you know, digitally. Um, yeah, I never really anticipated that it would be read by anybody beyond just my friends and football buddies, you know, from college. Uh, but, you know, I guess it, it, you know, it was read a little bit more broadly than that. Um, I didn't know quite how broadly until we got back from Iraq and I was at the Marine Corps ball and our battalion commander walked up to me and he's like, Wood, you're a decent writer. Thanks for taking it easy on me. <laughs> 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 At which point I, I sat there, I'm like, oh, shit. he knew about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, now those things grow legs, man. So especially, <laughs> so you, so, you know, sometimes uh, people are a little bit too honest when, they, when they're writing stuff down, but uh, yeah. that, that, that's cool. So let's, uh, let's shift gears to your book, uh, Once a Warrior. So can you let the audience know uh, what this powerful book is about and uh, why you decided to tell the story now? So Once a Warrior is a, you know, a memoir uh, of my journey, going to war, coming home, and then building Team Rubicon over the last decade, um, you know, and all the, the tragedies and triumphs that happened along the way, um, and plenty of tragedies. Uh, you know, I, I wrote the book, I started writing it two years ago, really because my, my first child was born, my, uh, you know, a little girl, and you know, that, you know, it's, it's cliche, but it puts life in perspective. And one of the things that I started to think about early after she was born was the, that at some point, you know, whether it was 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 25 years from now, she was going to ask me about my experience in war. And I was going to have to have a, like a really thoughtful and honest answer for her. And I, and I realized that I probably hadn't spent enough time actually thinking about what my wartime experience meant to me, because you kind of just put it in a box and you shove it away and you don't really think about it that much. And I was going to want to be more forthright with her. And then the second thing was, you know, Team Rubicon had finally gotten to this point where, you know, we had built something that was special and that was going to outlast all of us. You know, I think we've built something that's got the foundation in place to be an organization that'll be here 100 years from now. And that and I felt like getting that, that founding story down on paper really mattered and made sense. And so I, I sat down and, and wrote a proposal and, and took it to New York City uh, and spoke to publishers. And what's interesting is I tried to write this book six years ago and I got rejected 37 times by publishers. Um, and obviously in the six years after that, the, the story changed pretty dramatically because Team Rubicon changed dramatically, but it, it felt really good to, to go back after being rejected 37 times and, you know, in true Marine Corps fashion, just, you know, not have the word quit in you. Absolutely. And, you know, I was able to, to sell it to a publisher um, and, you know, it was great because actually three people that had rejected it six years ago got in a bidding war for it, which was awesome. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it was, it was, uh, it was a powerful experience and, and much like writing did for me during my time in Iraq, it really helped me process everything that had happened from the, the friends I lost overseas to the friends I lost when I came home, uh, you know, to the the challenges that we had, the long nights, the sleepless nights, trying to build an organization from scratch in the shadow of the Great Recession. I mean, all of those things, uh, it really helped me process and structure it in a way that, that, you know, looking back, I think was really necessary for me. 
Yeah. Well, I'm 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 glad you um kind of was very persistent in, in getting getting that message out because uh like like most of us in the military know it's 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 tough to talk about that stuff uh and we don't just inherently go and talk to our family or our friends about what we we dealt with and so uh you know you, you the way you did it the form of writing that you you did uh was probably therapeutic for yourself and it also uh, allows people out uh that are you know wearing the uniform to know like it's okay to talk about it it's okay to get get help uh when it comes to that type of stuff yeah i mean i realized at a certain point as i was in the middle of writing it that um the more honest and raw that I could be, the better the message could relate to people. I, I you know, I understand that I've got a, a platform, you know, as the CEO of Team Rubicon, I am a voice in the veteran space that for whatever reason, some people listen to. And, you know, I think it was a powerful opportunity to demonstrate to people that Hey, like we all struggle in our own way and, and that's okay. You just gotta, you gotta fight through it. You gotta fight with one another through it and, and uh, you know, never give up hope that there's a, you know, a better tomorrow for you. Congratulations on the, on the book. It's a terrific read. What are you hoping that readers take away from your story? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, there's different audiences for the book. Um, you know, so if you're someone who doesn't have any experience with the military, you didn't know anybody that served, I, I hope you walk away with a more nuanced understanding of what uh, our warriors go through overseas and in, in, in their in their return home. You know, not everybody that goes overseas wins the Medal of Honor and is starring in a Rambo film. Um, you know, and not everybody's coming home with with you know uh, you know crippling post-traumatic stress, but some people do. And, and the, the, the really even the, the understanding of what those, those psychological burdens are, are much more nuanced than a four letter diagnosis like PTSD. And, and those are things like survival skill, survivor's guilt and moral injury. And these, these more nuanced uh, psychosocial challenges that veterans have coming back. Um, you know, two, I, I really wanted, you know, veterans that were reading it to, to understand the power that having a mission and a purpose in that transition can can play in that transition for you and, and making it healthy. You know, I what I've seen in my time with Team Rubicon is this opportunity for veterans to become the better version of themselves as civilians. And it's it's a really incredible thing to witness. And I, I want people to understand that your best days aren't behind you just because you got out of the Marine Corps, or the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, whatever it might have been. Your best days can and should be ahead of you. And you, you, you owe yourself that to go and figure out what it is that you're going to be after the military, to pursue it with that same relentless tenacity that you had while you were in, and to find joy in something outside of that uniform uh, while, while never losing the pride that you had for wearing it. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. And a little bit more about Once a Warrior. At its heart, it's about leadership. So how would you describe your leadership style? What makes someone a leader from your perspective? I, I'd love for, for us to get some of my, my team on to describe my leadership style. I'd love to be a fly <laughs> on that wall. Um, <laughs> well, some, somebody's blogging about you right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the tell-all is going to come out. You know, I think that I'm a you know, I think I'm a confident and decisive leader, but you know, what I think has been my, the reason why I've been successful as an entrepreneur is not because I was confident and not because I was decisive. It was because I was humble enough to admit what I didn't know and surround myself with people who were super talented and can challenge me and teach me. And I think a lot of what young leaders do is they they shirk away from uh, building a team that is as talented or more talented than them because they they lack the the self confidence, uh, you know, and they they really fall victim to their own insecurities as a leader. And I realized that listen, I was a first time entrepreneur. I'd never had a real job in my life. I'd never built an organization, and here I was trying to build one from scratch again in the shadow of the Great Recession. And and if I was trying to fake it people were going to see right through that. Like I had no choice, but to be, to demonstrate humility and vulnerability and admit when I didn't have the answers, because again, people would never have bought it if I was trying to fake it through that. And so I think that's been a, that was a really important lesson for me to learn really important trait for me to develop early. And I think it's, I think it's persisted. 
Um, and I think it probably surprises people when I give them that answer, because I don't know that I always come across as a, is like a, a vulnerable or, you know, a guy that's rooted in humility because I, I also can project confidence in the right, in the right situations. But, um, you know, what makes a good leader? A good leader is, is someone who is able to convince his or her team that they will do anything and everything in their power to make them the better version of themselves, right? In the pursuit of whatever the objective is, that they're not a means to the end. In some ways, they are the end itself. And, you know, if you can do that, if you can convince your people that you're going to take care of them, no matter the circumstance, um, you know, they'll run through walls for you. Um, and I, I, you know, I've seen that play out time and time again with Team Rubicon and all the fantastic leaders that we have internally. It's, it's, it's that which separates them from the others. Oh yeah, and, and in the military, we, like you know, we, we get on the on the job training and leadership, and so that's uh, it's just it's just really beneficial uh, to to go through uh, leadership training at such a young age, uh, and, and then come out on the other side and be able to apply those principles out in the civilian world. So, yeah, it's I mean it's the it's the old you know, in the middle of a hump. You know, uh, when you're taking that that five minute rest at the three mile mark, having the officer or the NCO tell everybody to take their boots and socks off and go through and inspect everybody's nasty feet. You know, that's that's a there's a practical reason that you do that, but that's also teaching people a level of servant leadership that I, I'm not sure everybody appreciates at the moment when they're sticking their hands on you know in between people's sweaty toes, 18 miles into a 24 mile hump. Um, but that's exactly what it is: is doing whatever it's take to take care of your people. Oh, absolutely. So uh, you, you, you spoke on, um, you know, your, uh, when you were doing your blogs, you were writing it for your football buddies, right? And, yeah. um, and so, and your story is very similar because you were, you know, in college, uh, you know, and then you, 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 9-11 happened or, and all this other stuff went on and it kind of inspired you to join the military, which is kind of what uh, Pat Tillman, right? Pat Tillman, had a similar story where he was playing football and then uh, he decided to quit football and, and join the army. And, you know, he tragically got killed. So uh, in 2018, you were the recipient of the Pat Tillman award. So can, can you talk to us about, you know, how much it meant to you to, to receive that award and, and how Pat's legacy kind of inspired you uh, to join? Yeah, well, I mean, make no mistake, it was it was one of the highest honors of my life. I think Pat is someone who I always looked up to and admired. And even before he joined the army, I you know I remember I was I just thought that guy was the most amazing player on the field because he one I was a Nebraska Cornhusker fan growing up, and he played for Arizona State. And one year, I mean, he just tore us apart in Tempe, Arizona. I mean, he was like a one man wrecking crew, and so. I always followed him when he went to the NFL and really admired just the way he played the game. And then of course he made the decision to join the army. And you know, at the end of the day, Pat was a really interesting and unique human being, um, not just a veteran. He wasn't one dimensional, but he was a man of conviction and a man deeply rooted in what he believed was right and wrong. And, you know, and I hope we can all say that we aspire to be that type of person. And certainly his death greatly influenced my decision to join in 2000 when he died in 2004. Ultimately, I joined in 2005. Um, and so to receive that award, uh, you know, 15 years later um, was just the one of the, those strange moments in life where things kind of just start to make sense a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I just I, I, I hope that uh, we look at men and women like Pat Tillman in this country and really hold them in the regard that they should be held in, particularly today when I think our country is really looking for people to hold in high regard. Like we shouldn't have to look that far to find the Pat Tillman's in America today. Absolutely. And, and, Ju and Julie perked up when you said Nebraska Cornhusker. <laughs> I did. Um, I'm an L L alum from the, the University of Nebraska. So oh, cool. So is, so is my family. mom. I was, I was born in Omaha and almost went to go play there, but went to Wisconsin instead. I saw where you um, you had received an offer from, from Nebraska and then ended yeah. up, um, but you were, you grew up in Iowa, um, Betten, Bettendorf, right? So yeah. yeah, I was also born in Omaha. So me and your mom, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. So, um, so the exchange, we hire heroes, including veterans and military spouses, and we can see firsthand how their service and their experience make them exceptional teammates. 
So you've worked with many veterans. What is your advice for veterans on using the using their skills that they gained while serving in new areas? I would just say that, you know, as you're getting out of the, the military, one of the things you'll often hear, at least at when I was getting out is, you know, people trying to tell you that you have to retrain yourself to be a civilian and forget all that stuff that you learned in the military. And I kind of thought that was strange when they were saying it back then. And I look back on it now and I'm like, what terrible advice. I mean, <laughs> the truth of the matter is you have learned how to win. You've learned how to persevere. You learned how to adapt. I mean, those are, those are lessons that you don't get those lessons in a four-year degree program. You don't get those. I mean, you might, maybe you get those lessons being a high school wrestler or playing, you know, sports, like, you know, you get, a, you get close to it, but nothing replaces those soft skills that people get. And then beyond that, don't, don't discount the, the real hard skills that veterans are being taught. You know, you are training on the best equipment to the highest standards and being counted on to execute in the toughest environments on the planet. Um, you know, it may not be an apples to apples comparison with whatever that civilian job is that you're looking to get, but what you've been able to demonstrate is that you're trainable, right? And again, don't ever discount being a winner. And if, if you know, if our troops are anything, they're, they're winners when it comes to high stakes. Um, uh, you know, the politicians might, might, uh, might lose our wars, but the, the troops certainly won them when we were there. Hmm. Good advice. So Jake, we've talked a lot about the book. Um, what other projects do you have in the works that you can share with the audience? Well, you know, my, my day job remains team Rubicon and, uh, you know, that is my, my baby. I've been doing it now for almost 12 years. I, I remain, you know, in the role of CEO, which which means I wake up every day and I get the opportunity to to serve uh, alongside incredible Americans in communities across the country. One of the things we're working on right now, you can see behind me, uh, we just launched a Veterans Coalition for Vaccination. Um, you know, the this country is not going to get back to normal from COVID nineteen until we get America vaccinated, and so we are relying on Team Rubicon's decade of operational excellence and manpower and woman power from six uh, veteran service organizations across the country. Groups like uh, Team Red, White and Blue, The Mission Continues, Wounded Warrior Project, Student Veterans of America, uh, you know, you name it, IAVA, uh, you know, and they're alongside us uh, working to ensure that these mass vaccination sites and these rural delivery sites uh, are making the vaccine equitably available for everybody across the country, regardless of their zip code. Uh, we see that as the fastest path back to back to normalcy. And at this point in time, you know, it's all about speed. Uh, you know, that's the most important tactic and, and we know how to work fast and we're, we're excited to, to bring that lesson to bear. That's awesome what you're doing um, for, for COVID and uh, that kind of goes into my next question. So we know COVID pretty much turned our life upside down and, and just, just made us do things a lot different. So uh, how have you and your family been during the pandemic and how has it affected your work? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, we're fortunate, uh, my family. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, 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 we live in a home. We, we were able to keep our job. We, you know, we, we had food on the table every day. Our kids aren't school aged. And so we didn't have to worry about remote learning, you know, and so it's hard for us to complain about having to wear a mask or having to be socially distant from people that we care about, you know, because so many people suffered so much more greatly than we have. You know, that being said, we did get COVID, my wife and I, uh, you know, a, a month and a half ago, we got, we actually ironically got it from our doctor's office. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. Cause you know, we had a child, our second daughter was born uh, three months ago and she was born with a heart condition. And so we were extraordinarily careful uh, you know, and making sure that we were taking care of her and we got it at a, at a, one of her checkups. And, uh, so, but again, we were lucky, you know, we, we, uh, we caught it, we were symptomatic for a couple of days and we, we got over it and not, again, not everybody was that lucky. So, you know, when I reflect back on the last year, what did COVID do for me? Um, you know, it made me work from home for the last 12 months, which I don't enjoy, but you know, I, I walked through that door right there next to me. 10 times a day to get coffee, lots of coffee, uh, and go to the restroom. And every time I walk in there, I get to go hug my daughter, you know, play with her for a minute, two minutes, five minutes, and you can't replace that. Um, and so, you know, you got to find the blessings amidst everything that we've been through. And, and I certainly have been focused on that. 
That's great advice, especially as we're coming really up into a year of kind of being locked down. So that's, that's great advice is to find the blessings in, in the everyday. I also wanted to take this opportunity to turn to our live feed and just kind of let you know that people are watching from all over the world. We have Wendy who is watching from Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst in New Jersey. And we have Dennis Mori, who says he is prior active army. And he says he's also watching from New Jersey, Millville, New Jersey. So getting some love from the garden state today, <laughs> it sounds like. And then we do have, um, Someone else who is saying, um, Alan, he says, never quit. Thank you for your service. That's Alan Needham. Don't know if he's watching from New Jersey or not, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. It's a good good mantra to live by. You got it. And then, oh, Celia, she's watching from Waldorf, Maryland. So you're representing on the East Coast hardcore this Hi. afternoon. Well, a Midwesterner turned West Coaster. I don't know what to think of that. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Jake, as a reminder for our viewers, it matters where you shop and once a warrior is available at shopmyexchange.com. Where can viewers go to follow you and find out more about all the great work that you're doing? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find myself. I mean, you can find me on, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of those. I don't, I don't snap or talk or whatever. To, <laughs> don't do that. But, uh, and then, you know, I'd really encourage people to follow team Rubicon, obviously again, really easy to find across any channel and then check out veteranscoalition.org. Um, you know, that's, that's where people can go. If you're interested in serving and supporting vaccination sites in your community, uh, we we've made that open source, those opportunities. And we'd encourage any of your listeners or viewers to, to go and find out how they might be able to plug in and help get America vaccinated. Awesome. So Jake, man, we just really, really want to thank you um, for, for you know, showing us the love today. Uh, we want to thank you and your team for what you're doing for our, our military community out there. I think that's awesome that you're continuing to serve uh, post, uh, you know, post uh, separating from the military. That's an awesome thing. And uh, having you just means a lot to our, our airmen, our soldiers, our guardians, our sailors, our Marines, and our Coast Guard members out there in the world. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and we wish you all the best. Uh, in all your future endeavors. Well, I appreciate it. It was great joining the Chief Chat, and uh, hopefully, you can have me back on at some point in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. You're all right, now always we'll welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chief Chat out. Chief Chat out. Bye. Bye, y'all. <laughs>